excellent, so that's all good there. Um, my website is Anesthesia Collective. All of the things that I provide, courses, everything, will be there. And I've got a number of courses already out and a few more that will come out on more be beginning, beginning and beginner's guide to anesthesia kind of things as well. So let's get straight into it. Pain, what is pain? How to assess it and how to manage it. I mean, that, that really is everything I think we need to know at this level. And to do this, I just want to go through lots of drills for maximum impact of, you know, case-based journey of a patient. Um, we'll do lots of structuring, categorizations, so that you can communicate really effectively to your bosses and to your colleagues. And also, I'm just going to go through so many different scenarios that I've got, I've had in real life, um, and you all get in real life. And that way, you know, you, you can just see which, which, you know, what things are applicable at, you know, whatever time. Uh, quickly, David, are we a hard finish at 1.30? No, not necessarily. No, um, cool. there's, someone's going to have a chat about something else at that time, but no. Uh, that's right. I'll, I shouldn't be too, uh, I shouldn't be too bad around there. Hey, so the first we thing. Um, go we what was that, Corey? Uh, I was just saying, we always finish on time, don't we, Dave? Yeah, yeah, absolutely you do. <laughs> Every week. Hey, Corey. Ask Dave Woodward. I might ask you, uh, what is pain to you? Hey, Putting it, Corey, you are absolutely right. And the fact that you've just kind of verbalized that, not everyone's going to remember this IASP or the International Association for Studying the Pain, their definition is very specific, but you've essentially hit those two points. It's a sensory thing and it's an emotional thing. Um, the extra thing that they've added is it's actual or potential tissue damage. So you don't even have to have damage of tissue for pain to be a real thing. But that was, that was a really good just verbalizing of what the issues are. So just know, no matter what it is, like, you know, often you hear like, there's a typical thing. I remember when I was in ED, people would, we would kind of talk around these patients who'd come in pain and they really wouldn't have any physical tissue damage. And, we, you know, it, 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 it kind of states by definition that you really don't have to have a physiological problem that you can identify. So I think it's really important that we address that. And nociception does not equal pain. Uh, for example, you might have some kind of pain and it might be uh, might, some kind of nociception. It could be a pleasant experience uh, just because of the context of it. Um, and it's influenced by so many things, you know, culture, age, gender, personal history, for example. So that's a good way to get started. So now imagine this 35 year old presents with abdominal pain. Now, They've started off with appendicitis. It's characterized by this gradual onset right lower quadrant pain. Um, and that is true kind of visceral pain that then localizes. You might start to put the cannula in. And because they're so needle phobic, they complain of pain or they jump from pain even before you touch the cannula to their skin. So, you know, that's that emotional and sensory, the emotional perception of it. Then the patient reports sharp, well localized pain as you insert the cannula. That's obviously, you know, that somatic pain of a needle going through, going through the skin. And but the seven several days later, you might get this cannula site that's a little bit, you know, uh, reddened, and that way, uh, you know, it's warm to touch. The patient complains that it's a dull pain, and that it really should have healed by then. So now you've got this bruise that's caused this kind of allodynia and hyperalgesia type syndrome. And then several months later you might have this whole thing where the patient reports intermittent payment over the site, exacerbated by stress and by proximity to a healthcare setting. So clearly pain can evolve in this one patient and it has so many different etiologies, but the pathogenesis is well known and it, and it all is pain. I thought I'd just get that out of the way just to frame everything we're going to talk about. Hey, now I might just go to someone and get okay. This, this is a bit tricky. Does anyone want to have a go at just describing what each of these terms mean? when there's yeah how are you doing um isn't it when there's um essentially someone is experiencing pain from otherwise normal stimuli oh that's that's allodynia so pain from a non-painful stimulus and so hyperalgesia is similar to that what do you reckon that could be i guess in, <laughs> i guess from what you've said then it's just, then it's um presumably pain out of proportion to um to to stimuli exactly yeah so no Hyperalgesia, painful stimulus is now more painful. Allodynia is not painful normally, like touching, and that causes pain. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think it may not be the best example. If you have a bruise, touching a bruise, it's not normally painful to touch a bruise, but touching it will cause a lot of pain. So that's allodynia. Likewise, the same bruise will have hyperalgesia because if you, if you were to put a pin on that spot, it would be far more painful than if you, if you didn't have the bruise there. Um, nociception, now that's really just the, you know, the nerves 
feeling of this, you know, this, the sensation or the receptors being activated. Hey, Daniel, what do you recommend neuropathic pain? What's that about? Um, neuropathic pain, to my understanding, is pain arising from um, the nerves themselves. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it's not due to um, to um, uh, stimulation of the nociceptive receptors. It's actually from the nerves themselves. Perfect. Yeah, exactly right. If you imagine the endpoint receptors, that's usually where you sense stuff. Um, with all the cytokines that are released when things are touched or you know things are cut but now you've got the actual nerve fiber and this is obviously neuropathic pain it's really horrible to have it and it's very characteristic now central and peripheral sensitization you'll hear lots so i thought i put these definitions up as well and so you know central increased responsiveness of nociceptive neurons in the central nervous system to their normal or sub-threshold after an input whole bunch of stuff but it's increased responsiveness of your neurons in the cns whereas peripheral is increased responsiveness of your nociceptive neurons in the periphery. So again, common definitions that you'll be asked if you're ever kind of doing pain rounds or you know, you're trying to impress your pain bosses because you want to get into anesthetics. Now, most common classifications you'll get are acute versus chronic. Hey, Timothy, what do you reckon acute versus chronic? Like what, what defines chronic pain? Um, so acute pain um, is more like in a re in response to like a painful stimuli or something that's happened recently mm -hmm. chronic pain more um like prolonged um isn't um subsiding has gone on for maybe multiple some... weeks or months things yeah, like that exactly. how, how many months do you reckon okay so if i was to put a figure on the months often you see these numbers of three to six months bandied around and i like what you said you said the obvious answer right acute pain is kind of in a short time frame, it's got a very specific pathogenesis. You know, you have a surgical incision, for example, and chronic pain is later on when you would have expected that surgical wound or that wound or that trauma to heal, but you still have pain. So there's no real physiological reason that you can see from the trauma or the inciting incident. So often we just say three to six months to give a bit of leeway, even though things should heal before then. So acute versus chronic pain, then you've got your type. So that's the time frame descriptions. Then you've got your, uh, your actual thing that's been injured, somatic, visceral, neuropathic, and then cancer and non-cancer. Now we won't go through too much to cancer and non-cancer because often it is chronic and often it can be neuropathic and it's a very complex area. And I'll, I'll rather give you resources if, you get, if you're really interested on, on where to find answers to this kind of stuff. Okay, so how do you assess pain I'm just going to ask someone, and, and this might be the most captain obvious of statements. Um, Alex, medical student, what do you reckon? How do you assess pain? You're probably the perfect person to answer this question. Um, so, yeah, so I guess what we've been taught typically would be, say, asking the patient, um, how would they rate their pain from zero to 10? And then give an example of 10 out of 10 pain being something very severe and zero being no pain at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know we've, um pediatrics there's like a, a scale you can use that sort of has the the happy face and the sad face and then yeah that's good that's, that's called the wong baker faces scale really useful um yeah keep going how else do you assess pain um you could um sort of assess how to what extent it impacts someone's life so their sort of perceptions of the pain oops um yeah so if they feel like the pain Pain, like I guess some people might have a similar score of pain, but the extent to which it impacts on their day-to-day -day life and um, their quality of life might differ. Yeah, fantastic. So you've said two really important things and we're going to go more into it in more detail. Now, even though you gave me a really great answer, Alex, I want, every time you get asked to assess anything, I want you to say history examination investigations because that's always the framework that you're going to, you're going to go in. You nailed the very detail of what I do on any pain round. And I just want to add, normally when you assess something, it's always assessing for diagnosis. So imagine someone presents to ED with you know, new onset pain. Really, you do a history examination investigation because you want to know the diagnosis of the pathology. And then you assess that. And then you ask all your pain questions, which is exactly what you did, and assess function, which is exactly what you did. Um, so really, really good answer there. Now, if there's a known diagnosis, for example, post-op pain, you know that there's an incision, the surgeon took something out, made a few cuts here and there. Then you also do a history examination investigation, broadly speaking, but practically 
you really just talk about severity and function. And then we go into like looking at the whole assessment of the treatments and optimizing those treatments. Um, and you get some really good... Now, Alex, because, because this is right up your alley, what, can you rattle off the pain questions? <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to pick on you. No, that's all right. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a, yeah, a classic sort of set. So probably, I guess, yeah. Um, so I guess it could be sort of like a, yeah, Socrates approach. So nice. the site, the time of onset, um, the character of the pain, if it radiates anywhere, um, if there's any sort of um, associated symptoms. Uh, so the timing of it, so is, is it colicky or constant? Um, and then impact on life, uh, any exacerbating or um, alleviating factors like either um, positioning or um, analgesia. And then... Uh, S for severity, so from zero to 10, typically. Beautiful. That was really great. Um, now, often when you get a whole list of things, it's great to have some kind of mnemonic, whatever it is. I think we used to learn a lot Radio FM and Socrates, fantastic. These days, I really just think of the who, what, when, where, why, how. That really helps because they kind of group together really well. I'm not going to bore you guys with this, but really, you know, where it is, is where is it in radiation, severity and character, onset, periodicity, offset, associated aggravating relieving like it all just kind of fits in pretty well um so i don't spend too much time worrying about trying to memorize them so this is going to be the crux of the talk we've got we've gone through all the basics of you know the definitions and the assessment and the frameworks for assessment um but really let's talk about practically what we do because i think that's what's most relevant for your stuff the stuff that you'll do in ward on in the theater and post-op so dave now dave is 60 year old male he's 70 kilos he's got no other past history uh, yet that is ominous as you can imagine and he's going to have a pretty unlucky pain journey now imagine he's um you know you're, like essentially you're doing a post-op pain assessment you're on the pain round and dave had a he, he loves his motorbikes and he had this uh tibial fracture open reduction internal fixation on and that was day two poster he's on a pca what do you gather for each patient review so i might ask um renita whittle um when you see that patient just give me the big topics of what you'd um what information you want to gather as i'm asking people questions I, I really do want people to think for themselves and write down notes and whatever just to see that they get all the answers to this if renita's not available i might ask um will scup hey will what, what what kind of information would you gather about pain for this patient Oh, Will, hey. <laughs> Did you ask me that? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm being, I'm just being uh, harassed no, by fine. one of the, <laughs> by one of the community mental health staff here. So I missed the question. Oh, um, yeah, oh, can look, can you just, come back to me for another one? I can come back to you, no problems at all. Okay, so what I'm going to gather is a severity score, just as uh, someone previously said. And that's often just one to 10, or if they're children or have bad English or something, you've always got a scale. And the Wong Baker faces is a really good way of getting an idea of improvement. Like, you know, often we don't care about the number. We just want to know what they perceive the number is and that whatever intervention we're doing is actually helping and improving things. So yeah, that's your severity score and the Wong base Baker face scale uh, is useful for that. And the next thing is function. Like this is, this is the real big stuff really. So when I think of function, I think of essential activity and the site of injury, and then the general functional activity score that I can class, because that's the way I can communicate and also see improvement. So when I think of essential activity and site of injury, this is kind of what I uh, think about. So function, essential stops all the real, you know, importance of sleeping, eating, walking, moving, deep breathing, cough. If my patient can't do those things and they should be expected to do it, then I've got a problem. And I need to manage this. For example, you know, if they have a leg injury, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to walk straight away if they're non-weight bearing, but I would need every one of these patients to be able to deep breathe and cough. And if they can't achieve that for whatever reason, then I've got a problem. Um, the site of injury, so this is always variable. Imagine someone's got a, uh, you know, a shoulder operation and at a certain point, they should be able to mobilize that shoulder and you know, it, should, it should work decently well. If they, if they can't do that, I need to, again, think of, think of um, whether my pain management is working well enough. Um, and then obviously anything specifically important to your patient, sport, work, caregiving, whatever they need, you got to give them enough pain relief to be able to achieve those activities of daily living specific to them. So essential stuff, 
and site of injury stuff. So literally on the pain round, I've got, you know, gather the notes, you know, the med chart and the history. I ask the patient how they're, how they're going and specifically go, can you deep breathe and cough? Can you mobilize? Are you eating, sleeping okay? And then what's your site of injury like? And final, and once I've done that, I know what my function is and I give them a functional activity score of A, no limitation, B, mild limitation, or C, severe limitation. Really, most patients post-op are A or B. If they're, if they're in, you know, in the immediate post-op period, they might be C, but you'd expect that to get to B uh, pretty soon. That's, that, that's why I love pain rounds. They can be really quick. You literally just document this stuff, you know, take them off the PCA, and then you move on. So uh, I'm going to ask someone, uh, how do you manage pain? I want you to think really broad on this question. Yeah, so I guess you can talk about pharmacological and non-pharmacological beautiful um and i guess a non-pharmacological but can be things like positioning or certain dressings um ice warm packs etc but also i think there's an element of non-pharmacological in terms of like discussing expectations like some people ex may expect to be entirely completely pain-free after a significant operation so i guess that sometimes falls under non-pharmacological um and then pharmacological, we talk about multimodal things. So I always forget, um, I remember some of the basic ones, but I know that every analgesia works on a different pathway. So you want to try and target different parts of the pain pathway. Um, but usually we always talk about things like paracetamol and an anti-inflammatory as basic analgesia and having those regularly, if appropriate, for their kidney function um, and liver function. And then we can talk about um, weak opioids, things like tramadol or tapentadol, going up to more strong opioids like pure oxycodone or things like morphine, PCAs, for example, or, or um, local blocks um, or regional blocks. Beautiful. And so I, I really, first of all, I really love your categories because again, when you're, I, I asked this for our last quick care interviews, I literally said, how do you manage some person who's got a hand injuries pain? And the people that scored best gave a really broad category, exactly what you said, non-farm and pharmacological. Now the extra thing which you actually touched on here is, and without saying it, you mentioned it, you've got the non-farm and farm is your non-invasive. And then you've got your invasive, which is like your, you know, if, if you're going to puncture the skin, it's invasive. Uh, what, what do you reckon I mean by invasive, Nick? Do you mean like um, like regional nerve blocks? Or... Absolutely. Anything yeah, else? Okay. I can't think of much else that comes under invasive. No, that's right. Look, you, you've covered most of this stuff. So distraction, mobilization, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, slings, rest, ice, compression, elevation, pharmacological. You've, you've already answered um, pretty much one of the future questions, which is what are all the ways you can kind of give analgesia? And multimodal is a really good approach because you want to target multiple receptors uh, and we've got a lot of benefits of that. So invasive, um, you know, we, I, I didn't always think about this, but like, let's say you have a fracture, surgical, you know, surgical correction of that fracture is one of the best ways of healing that fracture and decreasing pain, as well as draining of abscesses and infections, taking away a pathology like appendicectomy. So, uh, you know, I'm always thinking of that as the overall strategy as well, you, you know, and, and regional blocks that you already mentioned, which I haven't mentioned there, but I put in pharmacological. So again, the reason why I want you to do those categories is uh, because not, 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 not only in real life, some of the simplest things, non-pharmacological will be totally within your scope of practice, even as a junior doctor. And so you'll be very effective with treating pain without having to overdose people on, you know, overdose people on um, opioids and things. So let's go on to this case too. So this is Dave again, you're the only doctor in ED and he just happens to come in with a closed ankle fracture. So he just had a tibial fracture from a, a motorbike accident. Now he's gone water skiing and he's coming with 10 out of 10 pain from that. How do you manage his pain? Um, I guess, so giving him um, some <clears throat> analgesia. So probably start with the basic stuff like paracetamol and NSAIDs, and then he probably needs something more like an opioid. Um, and then, yeah, reducing the fracture would really um, probably be the main thing that would help with the pain. Beautiful. Let's say you're the only doctor there, you're junior, and the, the, you know you don't have a surgeon there or a, one of your senior ED colleagues. Um, Emily, what, what level are you? Uh, medical student. Medical student, great. So this will be perfect. What else can you do uh, that's non-pharmacological to treat this pain? And you were kind of right in saying reduce, but... 
um, I guess maybe like a mobilizer and positioning. I'm not Fantastic. too sure. And what do you mean by positioning? How would you position it? Um, elevated. Absolutely. So think broad. Um, so when you, after you assess, the non-farm stuff is immobilization. So back slabs are definitely things that even medical students can do, especially, you know, I don't know how remote the Kimberley is and how much staffing you have in various hospitals, but, you know, if, if your boss is busy with something else and not even in, you can absolutely try to immobilize with a sling or a back slab and rest ice elevation, maybe not compression in this case. And then what you mentioned, and this is what most people go straight to is the pharmacological, and you're absolutely right. You want multimodal, uh, you know, paracetamol, non steroids and opioids, and you're probably likely to give a bit of that. And finally, as you mentioned, surgical fixation is your, is your ultimate treatment. Now, I want you to imagine all the scenarios that you could effectively use non-pharmacological methods for. Now, just have, have a think about these. Um, hey, Corey, what do you reckon? Like, what are other non-pharmacological methods that you've used in real life or? Off the top of my head, one of the main ones is, uh... So your chronic pain patient that often presents to ED, um, uh, there's one up here that has chronic abdominal pain and I've had some success sort of just sitting down with them, talking with them, giving them empathy. Nice. Um, and often that improves their pain without actually intervening at all. Um, so just being able to listen and talk. Uh, and then- yeah. Any methods for children that you found useful? Uh, distraction. Um, so I've got a bank of uh, fun photos and videos of animals on my phone uh, that I distract kids with. Excellent. Um, yeah, that's, that's, no, that's really great. Um, so when I think of all the things that I've done in the past, infants needing a short procedure, cold, like, you know, you can use, like, even if it's just ice, but you've got these special cold on, you know, uh, I think it's like uh, they, they can use... Um, uh, highly evaporative substances like ether and chuck it on certain certain areas to minimize pain sensation distraction like you mentioned sucrose is fantastic Frac any kind of fracture presentation we've kind of already mentioned slings back slabs really useful and then if it's anything that's caused inflammation you know decrease that inflammation somehow rest ice compression elevation so again i'm trying to think of all the things that i can do that work really really well even if i don't have all the strong opioids and all the kind of crazy anesthetic stuff that I can use. So multimodal allergy, some were already mentioned. Now it's really useful because you can, you know, essentially you target multiple receptors. So you can have probably better pain relief because you're targeting multiple aspects of your pain pathways, but also because you don't have to use as much of each individual drug, your side effects of each drug are reduced. And so this is something we kind of use definitely in analgesia, but I also found it very useful to think of multimodal um, antiemesis as well. So you'd often, you know, do multiple on Andanstrom, Maxilon, maybe Cyclozine, and you target all the different receptor groups. This is just really powerful to, to do that and effective. So we've already mentioned this, you know, just to ha have all of these ready to go, really, really useful. And that this, you know, this who analgesic ladder of using your non-opioids, weak opioids, strong opioids, and then adjuvants is, is really useful. Okay, so standard analgesic regimes. So what would you prescribe for this patient? Um, hey, Alex, just because you know, you're a med student and this is probably important stuff for you to be able to write up, what, what would you literally write up for this patient? 60 year old, 70 kilos. Um, so yeah, so I guess um, you could start off with, so sorry, so, so they're 60 kilos, 70 years old. Um, so you could start with, I guess, you might chart regular paracetamol as opposed to PRN, just so they've got a, um, a good base of, of yes. pain management. Um, plus or minus a, a regular NSAID, depending on their, if they've got any history of like gastric problems, gastric bleeds or kidney function issues. Fantastic. Um, and then, yeah, I'm not too confident about um, where you go with, with PRNs, but I guess, I guess you could sort of do like a, a once-off dose of a, um, like a, yeah, I guess a weak opiate or a strong opiate, opiate um, and then assess their response to that and then consider it um, either PRN or regular, just depending on, on how they respond to the, the simple analgesia too. Yeah, fantastic. So just know paracetamol one gram oral IV QID, ibuprofen or choose your non-steroidal, make sure they don't have any contraindications, put that on regularly, you know that they'll need enough of that to get built up. 
and tramadol, 100 milligrams oral IV QID. So uh, with the age of say 60 years old, I'd probably go, you know, 50 to start with and maybe increase it. So 50 oral IV QID to start with as they get older. And if they get really frail and elderly, it'll be like 50 TDS oral IV. If it was a young patient or, you know, anyone from, you know, a normal sized patient at a young age, 100 oral IV QID is absolutely fine. Now, when I, when, whenever I used to dose oxycodone, I used to always worry about, you know, what, what are the implications? Now, just know that this oral dose, usually the peak onset, I, like, so I think a lot about peak onsets of things. So, you know, to know how much you should give in the interval, you can always start with like the five to 10 milligrams. That's a very reasonable dose. Now, the peak onset is about one hour. Therefore, after one hour, you know that the nurse is not going to give medications to someone who's had too much opioids after that one hour. So just to give a margin of safety, I often find the two hourly PRN kind of system pretty, pretty, pretty safe and pretty effective. Um, obviously, if I didn't think it was a big injury, I'm not gonna write two hourly, I'll, I'll write six or four hourly for that five to 10 of oxycodone. So that's my standard regime. A lot of you, you know, once you've done your internship, all of this will be really, really obvious. So, you know, when do you need to avoid any of these meds? And so the funny thing is I don't, you know, MIMS has a massive list of contraindications and, and relative contraindications and interactions, but realistically, you've got a pretty severe liver dysfunction or malnutrition to not be getting paracetamol from me. Um, Non-steroidals, literally, you know, I'll just rush through this, you know, peptic ulcers, these are gastritis, asthma that's affected by non-steroidals, you know, concurrent renal impairment, bad ischemic heart disease, though that's not an absolute. If they've got some kind of issue with bleeding, uh, whether it's an inherited disorder or they've had a really high bleed risk operation like a TURP, you know, the transurethral resection of prostate or neurosurgery or spinal back surgery, or if they're just much older age. Then tramadol really seizures or use of other serotonin drugs. Now, does anyone have any experience with giving tramadol with serotonergically active drugs like antidepressants? Does anyone have any rules about that? Only that I've seen people on SSRIs and tramadol, but uh, like never more than three serotonergic drugs. Yeah. I've seen people on two, and I, I think that's just anecdotal. That's not really a rule. Yeah, yeah so I'm I'm pretty cautious with it. Like it's a it's like a it's a relative contraindication to give SSRIs and tramadol, but there's plenty of people on it. So if I you know if I had a patient who was in severe pain and really needed it. I would start them on a lower dose of tramadol and just really watch out for these kind of serotonergic symptoms. Um, but the ones that you definitely not put tramadol, put someone on tramadol on would be monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which is kind of the old antidepressants. So often you won't see them, see patients on them, but just to be aware that you really don't want to be mixing tramadol with Mayo inhibitors. Seizures is funny as well, because you know, we talk about seizures being a relative, a, as a contraindication, but there's no really good studies to show that it's any higher risk uh, than with other opioids anyway. But that said, if I really need strong pain relief for people, for ep epileptic patients, I'll use morphine and fentanyl and other opioids and oxycodone. And finally, opioids, you know, really, the, the interesting thing is with opioids, opioids are, have some of the most serious side effects, obviously, you know, sedation and respiratory depression, but the fact is that you can treat those pretty easily with your naloxone and with airway management. Whereas if you overdose on paracetamol, that's pretty much just death or liver transplant. So it's one of the interesting things where paracetamol is so readily available and so safe, uh, generally speaking, until you overdose. Whereas opioids are pretty, you know, um, uh, definitely have a higher risk profile and a narrow therapeutic range. But once you tip over it, you can still recover someone from opioid intoxication. We'll go through that as well. Now, this is one of the biggest things. It's so much easier when you have an electronic medical record, but after you write up Dave's analgesia, what are the very next medications you need to prescribe? Uh, so what do you reckon, Will? Hand in hand, you write up your, all your multimodal analgesia. What else do you need to prescribe? So if you're giving someone um, opioid analgesia, they are at risk of constipation. So I usually... Um, well, I usually start with just PRN, Mobicol, um, or Coloxal and Senna, but um, if it becomes a problem, then you can just give two sachets of Mobicol BD and two tablets of Coloxal and Senna BD. Yep. Um, he'll need DVT prophylaxis because of his broken ankle. Yep. And also, um, 
uh, what was I going to say? Sometimes people with opioids on board get a little bit nauseous. Um, metoclopramide would probably be my first line for that because I think it increases gastric motility. I'm not sure if there's any exact science behind that, but a palliative care physician once told me that was possibly a good one for opioid-induced um, nausea. Uh, and then um, Dancitron would be the other one, and I'd just write those up PRN. Fantastic. Now, um, so I also, I also think of NSAIDs. So if someone is on NSAIDs and they've got, if they started to have issues, for example, in, um, in the ICU context, almost everyone who's, on, who's in ICU itself, just from the stress, they might get ulcers, so they, they're on Nexium or something. Um, if I've got a patient on NSAIDs and they're on it for a long time, or they're also potentially got some gastritis, it's so low risk for me to start esomeprazole or Nexium, 20 milligrams to 40 milligrams daily. You're absolutely right about the opioids. So I always give two antiemetics and, you know, metoclopramide, yep, it's a prokinetic, absolutely. Uh, there was a bit of a warning about higher doses, so 10 oral T IV TDS. The interesting thing is there was these fraudulent studies that showed metoclopramide was not good, but if you took those studies away, it has some benefit. However, that benefit uh, is taken away if you give a drug of the same class as if. So, for example, on Danstron is 5-HT, and metoclopramide is a few different agents, uh, different receptors, dopamine and 5-HT, and maybe a few others. And so if you were to give ondansetron and droperidol, adding metoclopramide has been shown to not provide that much more uh, efficacy. So that's probably the interesting thing. That said, it's such an easy, safe, relatively safe drug to use until you get that patient with a dystonic reaction. And Will, have you ever seen someone getting metoclopramide dystonia? What would you do for them? Yeah. I uh, believe we gave them benzos and then canned the, ben <laughs> we canned benzos. the regular, uh, oh, I can't remember, it was a long time ago. Uh, no, we no. can't, we, she was in the ocular motor, what do you call it? Um, ocular gyric crisis? Yeah, that, yeah. Interesting, um, you, call, you call it benzos, but what they gave was benztropine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, it really effective. It's happened a couple of times in my career and I've given benzotropine and it's sorted it out. Also, I gave them an anesthetic and that fixed it as well. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of good antimates that you can give and all of these on Danstron, droperidol, cyclozine, promethazine or phenergan, um, really, really highly effective. Uh, constipation, I've got a different rule. Anyone who gets opioids, always on BD lactulose mandatory um, and Cloxal and Senna and Movicol uh, PRN. Now, my, the rule is the, the rule that I always learned was they have to pass one bowel motion a day. And if they haven't, you got to get them doing it. You never let the sun set at least, you know, definitely not twice on no bowel movements. And then pruritus, pretty easy, promethazine or phenergan, and maybe a small dose of naloxone, like 40 mics. Uh, and then the big stuff, respiratory depression and sedation. But you don't have to worry about that with the, generally speaking, in most young, healthy patients having reasonable dose of opioids, it's mainly with the infusions. Hey, so does anyone have any feelings on codeine, pros, cons? This is always a really interesting topic because I know, you know everyone, everyone uses it. It's like the thing that GPs can give really easily. Anyone got any feelings about this? I think there's variable metabolism of codeine to morphine. So some people it works and other people it's not as effective. Absolutely. Do you know what the rate of that genetic polymorphism is? Like I have 25. a number in my head. So on, is it like 25% long? Yeah, absolutely. So up to 30% in Southeast Asian population, maybe 6% in Caucasian populations. Um, and you look, I've got, I've got to say, I'm, I, when, when, we, when you go through anesthetic training, everyone is a real codeine hater. Um, but I've, I've learned to just ease up on it. It's just such a familiar drug. It's so low risk of side effects. Plus, if you want to stop coughing after COVID, it's fantastic for that. <laughs> I shouldn't say that on a public forum. Uh, decreases bowel motility. You know, if you need to be, you know, if you need to have less bowel motions in your patients, it definitely works for that as well. Um, but yeah, the cons are really variable bioavailability, especially postoperatively, and it's a prodrug, so it needs to be converted in the liver, and only a number of people will have that conversion. So, you know, the, the way we see it, if the patient does require strong analgesics, anesthetists will always prescribe tramadol oxycodone. It's very rare that I'd ever pick up a script and go panadine for it. Um, also, panadine is subtherapeutic technically, unless you want it for antitussive or constipating reasons. 
So yeah, if you need codeine, probably do endone. That said, you know, it's just a familiar common drug. And if it works for you, it works and it gets converted to morphine and it's fine. On so that one thought, Lahiro, yeah. can I ask um, how, how do you feel about tramadol then as well? Because isn't it similar metabolism and variable uh, yeah. uh, effect based on that metabolism? Yeah, absolutely right. And you know, the thing is, I, have you, I haven't seen any studies of the genetic polymorphism being an issue in such high levels, like 30%. Have you seen any data on that? I'll check it out because that's a, that's a really good point. Um, the, tramadol, because of all the other effects, it will have, you know, I, I still see a lot of people using it. I often use it. It's just one of the things I'll write up. I just don't have a good sense of the problems with it. I think it's probably because codeine is just an older drug that has been studied more. But yeah, it's a really good point. You know, if your tramadol, it's one of those things as well. If tramadol isn't working, it's because it's got the serotonin and noradrenaline, noradrenaline uh, effects as well. It's still, it still makes sense to be part of multimodal analgesia, even if it's not converted to M1, which is the, you know, the kind of the morphine analog. Uh, but yeah, so you can, you can imagine circumstances where people are fast metabolizers or poor metabolizers. And there was a warning about giving tramadol in kids, I believe, because some people are fast metabolizers and that could lead to respiratory depression in your OSA tonsil patients or your yeah, kids in general, really. Can I ask a question as well about um, codeine versus, you know, using oxycodone more in ED? Absolutely. Um, I think that when I, I think there was an email maybe a while ago, it might not have even been at WAX, maybe at Fiona Stanley, about using too much oxycodone. Um, clinicians were using too much oxycodone in ED um, and it was quite expensive apparently compared to other medications. I'm not sure if that's true, like tramadol or codeine. Um, so I don't know if there's an argument for trying something else in ED, like giving a dose of codeine and seeing how they react. Yeah. And then if they respond, for example, and don't have as much side effects using that over something like oxycodone, is that really beneficial? Or What, what, what you say is... So Two, two, two questions there. A question of pharmacoeconomics, I, I won't even address because that's a very system thing. So forgetting the expense of each drug, which is variable and not part of my scope of practice or what, what I'm meant to be doing, so I, I won't really address that. But you're right. If something's really expensive, more and more we'll have to think about the pharmacoeconomic and utility of using these medications and you know what else could we use that money on. So really good point, but can't comment. Uh, but then the efficacy type thing, if, yeah, absolutely. Like they'll, they'll come a time when you just have a pattern of use of something that just seems really effective for certain groups of patients with certain pathologies. And if you've got that as a care package, as a, as a system, and, and part of that is codeine, you know, you, 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 maybe, maybe you're in a population where people often divert drugs that they, you know, you give them 10 of oxycodone or there's lots of junior prescribers or lazy prescribers. And they, you know, you, you give people with a, a finger scratch or something, 10 of oxycodone if and and then you know they'll sell it on if that becomes a problem absolutely codeine doesn't have those problems therefore i can absolutely imagine a case where that's useful if you however maybe you're in you know the outer suburbs in the southeast of uh, melbourne and there's just lots of like the 30 percent poor metabolizer population like the southeast uh, the asian population then you might go well in this population it's just not worth giving codeine it's it's, it's rolling the dice on their pain management so I think making those efficacy decisions could be very subtle and yeah, absolutely it can make an argument for either way. Great question. Yeah. Ooh, thanks. Hey, I love these questions, by the way. So, you know, we, we've definitely got time. Please keep them coming. So now moving on, Dave is not doing too well. So you've given, you know, you've given the standard multimodal analgesia, you've done your <laughs> appearance and you've done your antiemetics and all that stuff. And the nurse calls you to review because he's in severe unremitting ankle pain. His operation is booked in four days because they need the ankle swelling to go down before they operate, which is pretty standard for ankles. Now, what do you do about this severe pain? So I suppose if it's uh, severe and unremitting and it's sort of unexpected, you're assessing him again, going and have a chat to him. So if anything's changed, reassessing the ankle, making sure there's nothing different, nothing's moved. You know, if he's got whatever, a cast or some kind of... Um, support on make sure that's in the right spot and it's not pressing and making another issue and something separate to the actual broken ankle right um and then i suppose you 
um, looking let's at say, another I'll way. Give the I'll give you the answer to that. So let's say, yeah, the surgeons that review him, they're actually happy that everything goes well. And they say, yeah, you just, just fix his pain. Just fix his pain. All right. Um, if only just click your fingers, is that how it works? Um, yep. uh, so I suppose you'd be reviewing what he's on, um, what parents he's taking, how regularly he's taking them. Um, and see if it has any effect. I'm actually going to give you that, that that is the answer I want you to say. So after assessing um, serious organic causes, you then check that the, it's not only have you charted everything, but it's actually given. And the number of times I'll get a pain referral and the, you know, the intern has charted everything perfectly, but the nurse just hasn't given it or you know, the patient hasn't asked for it. And you see you know, the 20 of oxycodone, two hourly, over, you know, over this like couple of days and they've been given like, you know, 10 milligrams and it doesn't make sense. So you, can, you can't, you know, really worry about that until you have, uh, you know, everything actually given. So let's say you then do refer, let's say they have been given everything, Sam, and you refer to the acute pain service. When, when do you, when, what are the criteria in general for referring to the acute pain service, including this situation? What are some other reasons first one you've got the this patient here which you got which is severe pain despite the regular stuff the next category is you're expected to have really severe pain so you know rib fractures long bone fractures major operations like you know someone's had a laparotomy you, you, they're always going to have a pca almost, almost invariably um and that's often referred uh interrupt by the treating anesthetist and then a few other things and i actually haven't mentioned it here but you're absolutely right so in the other category, anyone who's got a pain syndrome, you know that they're going to need some assistance. But also, if they you know, require intravenous analgesic for any reason, you know they've had they, they, you know they can't open their mouth, uh, they've got ileus, they've got they're nil by mouth for any other reason. You'll just have to start them on a PCA or some kind of infusion system, and it might depend on your hospital. Now, um, I, I'm not sure where everyone's from, but I, I, from what I know, Broome doesn't have an acute pain service. And so really, you know, it means that you're going to have to refer, I think, to your, your GPA DMOs or the other senior staff to start these, these measures in place. So what are the es escalation steps for severe pain? So really, you know, you mentioned them already. So PCA is probably one of the early escalation steps, ketamine infusions, and then regional anesthesia ca catheters. There's probably a few more fancy things that you could do, but these are the stock standard of how I escalate. And sometimes I might go straight to the regional anesthesia catheter. Sometimes I go straight to ketamine. Uh, if they got neuropathic pain or expected really bad pain, you know, massive laparotomies like the liver transplants or liver, liver sections, or even open cholecystectomies. Um, but almost everyone starts off with a PCA. And then obviously anti-neuropathic pain meds are some more fancy things as well. So let's go with this. So you're the, let's say now it's that, that you, you've started them you, you got control of their pain and now they're in the operation with your anesthetist and the surgeon expects Dave to be in pretty decent pain post-op. So what are your options? And we kind of just gone through that really. Um, regional catheter, but let's say the surgeons are often worried about compartment syndrome because it's gonna be in that tibial region and the ankle region and they're worried about swelling. So you can't do that, um, but you could absolutely start a ketamine infusion and you could absolutely start a PCA. So the next question is, how do you prescribe these has anyone prescribed a PCA before? The, the good thing is that, I mean, exa exactly for this reason, you don't need to memorize a lot of this stuff. The pro there's protocols there and your staff and your nurses, they're fantastic. They'll know how to do this. So generally morphine is always one milligram per mil and it will be diluted in whatever the, the, the hospital does, whether it's 50 milligrams and 50 mils or 100 milligrams and 100 mils, depends on the PCA delivery device. And often it's one milligram, maybe two milligrams for younger normal sized males. Um, and it's often age dependent rather than um, like the, your, your tolerance to opioids is really far more correlated with age than weight. So anyway, one to two milligram bolus, lock out every five minutes. And sometimes I put a max dose, especially as they get older, I might put like a 20 milligram max dose in four hours just to be, just to be really careful about it. Um, fentanyl, the equal analgesic dose are two mil boluses of 10 mics for so 20 mics bolus. Again, lock out five minutes. And then occasionally I put a maximum dose of 100 to 200 mics in four hours. You can always review this. Um, so yeah, uh, again, you don't have to memorize this because it's almost always known, but if you're doing any of your kind of pain exams, you'll obviously have to, have to know this stuff. Um, what are the hazards of a PCA? And so let's say you prescribe morphine PCA, which he's using really well, and you're called urgently by the nurse and Dave looks blue. Corey, what do you, what do, you do? 
going back to first principles, Dr. Zabie CDE. Um, and it sounds like he's probably uh, uh, dropped his respirate because he's had too much morphine. So I'd be calling a met call uh, and hopefully, oh, there we go. Cool. You know, that's, so he's that's out. I, I, do it. Do we have? Do we have a respirate? Or, yeah, respirate um, is zero. <laughs> yeah, cool. So I'd be calling a met call and asking one of the nurses to draw up some knocks. Fantastic. Now, just to, just to highlight what Corey did really well, you know, obviously I've given you this kind of whole situation, and we're talking about opioids and PCAs and all that. But but just remember, you have to go back to doctors ABC because this could absolutely be a cardiac arrest. Um, and you you know, following that, you don't do any anything wrong. You know, by the time you're doing chest compressions in someone with uh, no, with an opioid overdose, you will definitely wake them up after that first very safe chest compression. So that's that's a very good way of doing this. <coughs> so let's say he is rousable, so, and you, but you notice that he, he takes one breath and then he goes back to just being completely apneic. You're absolutely right that he, he looks um, uh, like he's absolutely narcotized. So you'll notice that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, uh, do you know what the nurses monitor regularly to make PCA safe? And is there a specific thing you prescribe? Like, do you, do, do you have an automatic prescription of naloxone with your forms? They do absolutely this every time. Pain scores, respiratory pressure, or resp respiratory rate, sorry, and sedation scores. And then with the every PCA order, you know, absolutely anti-medics, appearance, uh, you might even give a small dose of naloxone for pruritus and proper doses for respiratory depression and sedation. So with naloxone, this is, this is just one of those really amazing drugs and you think, oh, it's so good that they've got this as the very direct antidote, but just think about it. Most medications, you're not lucky enough to have antidotes for it. Like if you give a propofol overdose, it's not like you've got an anti-propofol drug. You just got to ventilate and support the blood pressures that are, that are at rest. Um, so it's a direct antidote. Uh, what's crucial to know about some elimination Jump in now if you know what's important about naloxone, anyone. That's right, so it's a really short half-life. It might only last, like say you give 100 mics, 200 mics, it might only last 15 to 20 minutes and the opioids at a ridiculous dose will definitely last longer. Uh, so you may need to redose a few times. So this is one of those moments that, I don't know, if you ever, I hope, I don't hope, but I do hope that if you have this situation, you think of naloxone and you get in there and give your dose, um, for this patient is arrested because you will save their life very rapidly. Like they'll literally go from death back to life. Uh, and, and once you're doing that, uh, you know, give yourself a pat on the back, but don't walk away because they'll fall right back in a heap. So make sure that you're there to give the redose of naloxone and monitor the patient. So uh, this would be an example. So 40 mics, so it's a 400 microgram vial. Often the answer to every question of dose is one vial except in some very specific situations. Pruritus, it is not, the answer isn't one vial. You dilute 400 mics to 10 mils and give one mil at a time. It's an incredibly safe drug. There's very few contraindications that there is a potential chance of rapidly going to APO while, whilst using naloxone. Very unlikely to happen. If the rest, so these respirates are just a guide, but let's say the respirate gets down to about six, you, pro, you want to stop the PCN and call, call the doctor. That's often in the uh, in the orders, depending which hospital you're in. If the respirate's four to six, again, stop PCA, call them at, give them naloxone 100 mics, that's often in the order. And then if the patient's not breathing, there's a code blue, uh, give them naloxone, the full 400 micrograms IV, and obviously disconnect the PCA as well. So that's kind of the range of stuff that I would be thinking about with my PCA orders. Now, let's say despite, <laughs> there's a really bad, bad, bad couple of weeks for Dave. Despite appropriate multimodal analgesia and regular PCA use, he's still in severe pain. You rule out again a surgical cause as we did previously, which is really good. Um, what can you try next? And so I think someone already mentioned ketamine. How Has anyone started a ketamine infusion or given ketamine? I mean, let's give a bit of background. So again, ketamine, there's a few hero moments that you'll have in medicine that are just very specific. One is giving naloxone. Another one's probably giving sugar to someone with a low BSL. Regional anesthesia, absolute hero moments because they go from 10 out of 10 to zero pain and ketamine's the other one. Now it's a non-competitive NMDA antagonist. So real fancy receptors causes the diso dissociative anesthet anesthetic state. Um, and then, yeah, in severe pain, it's just an amazing, amazing drug. Now I'll just give you what I practically do, but just know that, you know, you absolutely have to use your clinical judgment if you're going to use drugs like this. If you've got someone in severe pain, 
Um, you know, obviously call your boss, get all your, get everyone, get the patient monitored in the right way with all their vitals monitored, including their rest rate. And the way I bolus is small doses, you know, 10 to 20 milligrams is incredibly safe in a standard adult patient. Um, but, and I also, I always give them the warning that you might, you know, you're in, you're in severe pain. This is incredibly effective, but you might start to feel a bit funny. You might start to see some things. Um, and for that reason, I also often give like 0.5 to one amid, one amid DAS just to take the edge off the hallucinations. And as I mentioned, monitor vitals. So the 40 milligrams, that's, that's completely fine as well. I'd build up to that, knowing that it acts in 30 seconds to a minute. So I give the 10, see the action of it. Great. It has enough, it hasn't tanked the patient. Another 10, wait a minute, another 10. You can always come back and give more, but you can't always take it away. So that's how I bolus it. And that's what I've done on the wards in, ex in extreme situations. Um, the infusion, again, th this, this would have to happen in Broome Hospital, I think in HDU from what my, one of my mates told me. So make sure they're absolutely monitored. A lot of it's just familiarity with running infusions and having systems in place and the appropriate pumps. And it's just a lot of work for the nurses to do a lot of monitoring. So you do need a more intensively monitored situation. But that said, this is as safe as running a PCA. You know, this is, it's a very safe drug. We give 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, maybe 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And so just to give you a rough idea, imagine you're diluting. Oh, hey, Dave, what are your dilutions in at Broome Hospital? Do you do like a 50 Yeah. Milligrams? So we'll um, offer dilution. We do um, 200 milligrams in um, 10, in 20 mils, sorry. Okay. We are standard ketamine. 10, yeah. so we've got 10 milligrams per mil. So imagine in a standard, you know, 70 kilo person, which is never standard these days, you know, giving one mil an hour, that's about 10 milligrams an hour. And so that is, uh, you know, just above the 0.1 milligrams per kilogram count. But so roughly, one to two mils an hour is kind of in that range uh, of 10 milligrams per mil. In my hospital, we do 50 mil syringes just because then we can actually, we've gone 100 mils. So it's two milligrams per mil. Um, and that just means that, you know, that one mil doesn't have so much concentration. So it's probably a bit safer uh, from, from an accidental bolus in, in it. Uh, anyway, so when I've started the infusions, they take a bit of time to, wear, to, to build up in the blood. If I haven't given a bolus, then that obviously that helps if I do. But I always consent this patient by saying, you know, this is a really safe drug. This is great for pain, but you might get some, you might some, see some things and it's really dose dependent. So I really make it very obvious to the patient that if you do start seeing things, some people love it, some people don't care, some people are distressed. And if you do find it a bit distressing, we just lower it, you'll be fine. The worst thing that happens from a pain point of view is that the patient says, I'm allergic to ketamine that someone's said, oh, you can't have ketamine, it causes hallucinations, when really it's dose dependent and you just have to run a smaller dose. Can you comment on its use in chronic pain syndromes? Because I see a lot of people in chronic pain coming for these ketamine infusions and uh, I, don't, I don't really understand the science of how this works, but then they almost say like, um, like in lay terms that it like resets the pain receptors yeah. or something and then they require less analgesia subsequently. So how does that work? Yeah, really good question. So if you if uh, this is very specialized and there's a lot that I don't know about and a lot that there's no evidence, uh, there's a lot, uh, there's a lack of evidence in a lot of these things. Uh, some of the things we do know is that let's say this, these chronic pain patients, they always have some level of uh, tolerance to opioids because they've been on it for a long time. There's a thought that starting an NMD receptor antagonist actually does reset it. So now they'll have potentially less tolerance to the opioids. So when they go back, they respond better to the medications they're already on. Um, so that's one of the things that could be there. Um, and the NMD, the, again, there's not so much known about the NMDA receptor, but it's just a fantastic method of pain relief. And it might have other far reaching effects that we don't know. So there's this thing called preventive analgesia and preemptive analgesia. Um, we can look those up. So preemptive, not much evidence for, it makes a bit of sense, but they don't have good evidence for it preventive analgesia. So preemptive analgesia is giving a medication before you start the stimulus or pain stimulus, and it should decrease the problem of that. That's not been really proven to work. Preventive analgesia is when you give a drug and even when the drug has ex, you know, completely gone away from the body, it's been completely metabolized, it still has an effect into the future. So if I run ketamine for someone in theater, it has some kind of preventive analgesia effect even you know, down the track. 
you experience that not only with ketamine, but also nitrous, which is an NMDA antagonist as well. Um, they've got studies that show that. They're not the biggest studies, but there's good evidence. I, I, my, my very first and only paper showed that uh, in, in these big trials using nitrous, that people had some benefit at six months um, from you know, use, just using nitrous, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist. So definitely theoretical benefit with preventive analgesia for the future. And also you can imagine that you know, giving NMDA receptor antagonists at that time is, is really, really great for neuropathic pain. So psychologically speaking, the patients had a bit of a holiday and a reset as well. So you can imagine that could be quite useful for them. That's probably about as much as I can uh, reference. I'll send everyone a, you know, I'll, I'll send everyone a book in the chat. This is the this is the resource um, for uh, you know pain management by uh, kind of the the person that's wrote, wrote all the acute pain medicine scientific evidence books, which just is a most amazing us compilation and it's an Australian thing compilation of all the evidence. And literally, if you looked up ketamine, you'll see what the hard and fast absolute data is about ketamine so i'll send that to everyone what do you make of these bloods sodium and potassium look okay <laughs> it's bicarbs on the higher end of normal <laughs> um his creatinine is pretty high i don't know what his urine urine uh uecs were like before like his kidney function was like before yeah he good looks like he, made he was okay. it was normal before and you're right it's increased so you're worried about some kind of renal injury absolutely so what are you worried about from a pain point of view when someone's got some renal injury? Uh, just dose adjustments for, for opioids uh, and also watching out for NSAIDs. I think you'd probably have to cease the NSAID in view of this. Yeah, good. And what is it about opioids that you need dose adjusting? Like, is there something about the kidney excretion of stuff that makes you worried? Your gut feeling is absolutely right. Like, so as soon as you have any kind of, what is it, age, organ dysfunction equals lower dose of everything. Now, the specific thing, interestingly, with all your medications that almost everything is just liver metabolized and it gets excreted once it's metabolized and water soluble gets excreted by the kidneys. But every now and again, you get this drug that's metabolized in the liver and the liver just attaches stuff to it. But that stuff isn't deactivating it. It's actually making it more active. So that's that whole pro-drug thing with codeine and paracoxib is a pro-drug and the whole bunch of other stuff that's a pro-drug. I think even clopidogrel is a pro-drug. So you... Some, some, some things are, have uh, expected active metabolites as part of their normal action and other things have unnecessary and unwanted active metabolites. And specifically, this is morphine 3 glucuronide, and which is M3G and M6G. What that just means is they put a glucuronide particle, the liver just conjugates morphine at the, six, the carbon 6 point or the carbon 3 point. And that's just the, fat, the shortened form of that. Now, the, the, both of these metabolites are active. They can, they can, some of them are very anti-hyperalgesic, uh, hyperalgesic potential and more efficacy. And some of them increase seizure risk. Ketamine has norketamine, which is an active metabolite as well. So again, now, instead of just getting cleared, it could potentially accumulate if the renal dysfunction is bad enough. So what do you do? It's actually exactly what you said, Will. Back in the day before we had fentanyl, people would still give morphine to patients with renal dysfunction. They just lower the dose and monitor them, make sure they didn't have the accumulation. So sometimes you just lower the dose. Other times these days, mostly we see we switch to meds with no active metabolites, which are non really excreted. So in our situation of a PCA for this patient, he's on morphine, you'd switch to fentanyl or you switch to oxycodone IV PCA. You, with the ketamine, you might lower the dose again, or you might um, just have to cease the ketamine if you're really worried about toxic, uh, toxic accumulations of this. And the way you know that patients are safe is really good monitoring. So the drugs you really need to worry about, morphine, ketamine, non-steroidals, pregabalin and gabapentin have almost 100% renal excretion. So that definitely you have to worry about, but most drugs are liver metabolized. And like we said, they metabolize to non-active stuff. So renal dysfunction isn't the worst thing. So we're getting, to the, we're getting to the end of the session, fortunately for time and everything. So Dave is now one week post RF. The PCA is ceased, the ketamine is ceased, renal function is back improved because now the NSAIDs have ceased and he's been resuscitated properly with fluids. But his, his pain continues and he complains of painful, cold feelings. Does it, what, what does anyone make of that? Sounds almost like a neuropathic style of pain. And because it's such a specific kind of weird type of... Um, 
you know, pain syndrome, we, we, and we don't really have any good firm diagnostic tools for it. We use these questionnaires. So the one that uh, you know, I, was, I, I used and I, I was um, learning for my exam was the DN4. Uh, so the dollar neuropathy for questions. Yeah, so essentially this questionnaire, you have greater than four points, there's a greater than 90% chance of actually having neuropathic pain. Here's the, the questionnaire. You can literally just Google this to find it out. But you know, let's say one of your patients has burning or painful call, anything that just seems nerve type pain, just do this questionnaire and you know, figure out. That said, if someone has any, even, even one of these things, I'll be, I'll be treating it cautiously because it, it definitely could be something progressing to that. So you, know, you get a patient with this, refer up, find out what you need to do. So here, take a, take a screenshot of this if you want to. Uh, actually, no, sorry, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just send it to you guys. It's just a PDF that's free from ANSCA. Acute Pain Management, this is an amazing book if you really just wanna know what actually works and what actually doesn't work. Neuropathic pain is so big and complicated. We're obviously not gonna go through all the detail of it. And all of these different types of neuropathic pain are treated differently. Like there's specific drugs work really well for some and not others. Um, but we'll think of the post-injury, post-operative circumstance most often. And I'll give you a little bit of a you know, snapshot of it. You know, you've got this table, it talks about gabapentinoids, TCAs, SNRs, SNRIs being first line, but also conventional and atypical opioids being really useful. And obviously ketamine is a fantastic drug for neuropathic pain, but not really that you know, usable in the outpatient setting. Now, the examples I'd give would be am amitriptyline. So again, just take from this what you will, you won't be starting this alone. You know, it'll generally be with a, you know, with a consultant or boss, or senior reg supervising you. But if you think someone's got neuropathic pain and you'd probably refer them on to a pain service potentially if they could, but if you can't do that, you'd probably start them on amitriptyline, 10 milligrams of Nocte. You can go up to 50 slowly over the next few months and then be just cautious about sedation and other serotonic, serotoninergically active drugs. So that's amitriptyline, probably the cheapest and one of the most efficacious the NNT for amitriptyline use is really good. Pregabalin versus gabapentin. So gabapentin needs TDS dosing. I would normally start if there's no other pharmaco kind of economic reasons, I'd just go pregabalin. Uh, but it's easier to get to the good plasma levels. And you start at kind of 50 milligrams daily up to 75 BD, sometimes more. Uh, but again, you, you want to be liaising with someone who's confident managing these medications. And what you get, you know, mainly main problems with that are sedation, dizziness, and sometimes you get muscle twitches as well. And once you kind of get those points, you definitely want to cut back. And then a lot of these things need tapered cessation as well. So in the context of like just a bit of neuropathic pain from a traumatic injury, what I found in my limited experience of managing this is you can start them on it and they're often on it for a few months. And then you just send a letter to the GP about tapering it off to a lower dose and then solving and, and then getting rid of it completely. Uh, if, if it all resolves. Now in the last 15, not 20, 10 minutes, uh, I thought I'd just go through some other useful meds. So really clonidine, someone mentioned. So cl clonidine, again, a really good drug, but not the savior drug. Like I've never given clonidine and just gone, yep, mic dropped, I've won the situation. That's never happened. Uh, so it, it's just another multimodal type thing. And it does a bit of everything, you know, some analgesic effects, some angiolytic effect, sometimes, is, you know, it can be antihypertensive. When I prescribe it, I just start at 50 milligrams, you know, BD up to TDS and maybe a max of like 150 a day and then only give, so in the notes I'll write, only give if systolic blood pressure greater than 100 or something reasonable for that patient. So I, I often start that, especially if they're hypertensive and really anxious, knowing that I might have some benefit. Now, Tepentadol is one of the drugs, you know, it, it, it came out a few years ago and I've literally never prescribed this drug, um, but this is a drug that has absolute utility in the, in, you know, in the environment. Now, it, the fact that, you know, it, 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 it's independent of CYP2D6, so you, you don't have to worry about interactions with that, which a lot of opioids will have but it uses noradrenaline and not 5-HT. So you have to worry less about having you know, antidepressants plus tepentadol. There's no active metabolites, unlike tramadol, which you often know, compare to, and very low rates of abuse. So, you know, seemingly a pretty good drug. I've just never, I've just never had to use it in my very perioperative context, but plenty of patients are on it. Um, does anyone have experience of using tepentadol and liking it or having any adverse things with that? We used to use it all the time on ortho um, for the elderly NOF patient because there was worries that using lots of tramadol would uh, make them loopy. 
Yep. Um, and that seemed to be fine. We actually used to give him slow release to pentadol. And, and what did you and do? And immediate BD? Yeah, start at 50 BD. And then we keep even going up to 100 BD. And it didn't seem to really necessarily cause any delirium or any issues like that. Did you find it really useful? Did you go, oh, yeah, we started this and they just improved? Did you find that? Uh, generally, no, because they came all out of the OT with it. Yeah. So it's hard to say. Not fair enough. Excellent. Any, anyone else with any experience, good or bad, with Tepentadol? At Royal Perth, it was standard that you're when, back when you were doing long acting opiates, you would start with slow release Tepentadol. Um, and I think they were also uh, using immediate release as their first line PRN, but with all of the PBS stuff with it, that's no longer the case. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, good, good to know. So those are those two drugs I might add in, just depending on the situation, definitely got their advantages. Now, the other thing that you will come across is just patient needing a quick procedure in a remote setting. And so just imagine that you've got these three, these three are pretty much these options that we haven't really talked about, but they're just really, really effective, especially say you don't have, you know, your GPA DMO an anesthetic colleague or, you know, ED consultant or senior reg, and they, you know, they're not there to give the fentanyl or the alfentanyl and profile and all the other fancy stuff. You can get through a lot with nitrous methoxyfluorine and uh, very low risk regional blocks. So essentially, nitrous oxide, you know, if, if most EDs have it, definitely your labor wards would have this if you really need to get something done. And so Entonox is a, you know, this mixture of oxygen and nitrous, which you can dial up in a very safe fashion. Um, and I think it gives a max of 70%. So you can never get a hypoxic, hypoxemic gas mixture. Um, the, you've got to wait for a bit for it to take effect and it can make your patients a bit loopy and nauseous, but again, it's a pretty decent analgesic effect and you can't really anesthetize a normal patient because the, you know, they call it the minimal, the MAC or the minimum alveolar concentration of nitrous, you, you know, even if you give hundred percent, that's not enough to anesthetize someone. So nitrous is really effective. You have to give oxygen at the same time because the uh, nitrous will kill you very, very quickly if you don't have oxygen. So if you hold your breath, you'll still just kind of gradually use up your oxygen. So you'll have a bit of time. But if you replace all your oxygen with 100% nitrous, you, you, know, you, you will just become hypoxemic very instantly. Um, after you cease nitrous oxide, so you do your procedure, you've given the nitrous, they're breathing on that, whatever the mask or the delivery device is. Uh, afterwards, you take it out, you've done your procedure, you give them a Hudson mask because the, oxygen, the nitrous oxide in your bloodstream comes out really quickly because it's so rapidly you know, transferred across membranes. In, and in that high volume of nitrous just displaces your oxygen. So you need to pump in oxygen with a Hudson mask at the same time for uh, you know, at least five to 10 minutes afterwards, just to be sure. And obviously monitor these patients. I don't know if anyone's used pentrain or methoxyfluorine. Yeah, so, so methoxyfluorine is the you know, pharmacological name. It's, it used to be a general anesthetic, but it's reformulated. So they, they absolutely banned its use because with prolonged use, you've got some pretty decent renal impairment. Um, but now they've got that green whistle that the ambos always, you know, take to the sports grounds and you, you might not readily be able to get this in pharmacy, but you, you know, you can order it in absolutely. And it's, it's, so it's called Penthrain. It's an Australian product. I don't have shares in it. It's just a really great way of giving instant, decent analgesia for short procedures. So again, imagine your finger dislocations or some kind of laceration repair, even in a kid, um, up to a certain age, you might be able to do, just look at the product disclosure information. You can use a maximum of two of these whistles usually, and it's just really effective for that. There's only really one contraindication. They can't have a history or family history of malignant hypothermia because that will pretty much kill them. Uh, so one question you should probably ask is that it's very unlikely that they have it, but hey, you definitely would feel like pretty bad about doing that if, um, if they did. And finally, nerve blocks. So um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know how to do your easy kind of peripheral nerve blocks, including your digital nerve blocks. But just remember, it, it takes very little skill to learn how to do an ankle block. Again, you don't need any fancy equipment, just need to know your landmarks and anatomy. And you get a 25 gauge needle, do a ring block around the ankle. And that's sort of the, your three superficial nerves. And you've got a couple of deep nerves. Um, at the top, you've got your dorsal, deep perineal, and at the back, the posterior tibial. You, you know, if you get on websites like Nysora, N-Y-S-O-R-A, uh, is it nysora.org? Anyway, New York School of Regional Anesthesia, they'll have instructions for things like that really safe block. Peripheral nerves are really safe from trauma compared to the central nerves. Um, and then scalp blocks, like 
you know, I want, you don't need to learn how to do a full scalp block, which is literally just a ring of local anesthetic around the scalp. There's these two nerves here, super trochlear and super orbital nerves, and they pretty much supply all of your head up to the vertex. So, you know, a lot of your uh, facial trauma or lacerations across your head, those four nerves across both sides of your face pretty much anesthetize the whole of the head. You need like a fraction of a mill at each site. And again, you can feel the grooves with the um, super trochlear and super orbital notch. That's where they exit, really easy to use. Um, there's some more advanced forearm blocks, which again, are really safe. Like I wouldn't tell a non-anesthetic person to be learning your blocks from your elbow upwards, but definitely elbow downwards, they're really safe. And you can probably learn it with, you know, as long as you've got someone to show you how to do it and use an ultrasound scanner. So I thought I'd just end with that as a few little teasers for maybe some other topics we could do, we could do in the future. Um, yeah. But essentially we covered all the definitions, pain assessment, you know, severity and function being really important, a broad approach to management, which is, you know, all of your interventional, so non-invasive, invasive, farm and non-farm, really great for when you're approaching an answer to be broad about that. Multiple analgesia, it's side effects and management of the side effects, severe pain management, advancing the PCA ketamine, even regional, naloxone for treatment of complications, renal impairment issues, neuropathic pain, and what you can do about that. And then a couple of other situations, uh, clonidine, tepentanol, nitrous penthrain, and nerve blocks. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely stay around for another few minutes. Um, please feel free to ask any questions. Larry, thank you so much again. It's really appreciated. Thank you very, very much in your own time. It's great of you.